purpose of this evening is to get confused. And I'm hoping that Liz and Paul can both help me in different ways go deeper into that confusion, the purpose of which is to not to stay forever lost, but to actually to recognize yourself as lost in a certain sense and thereby be more likely to be found. So first of all, we're going to hear from Liz. And um, I think that's really all I need to say. Thank you. Um, yes, it's good to hear that myself and Theos more broadly are doing our little bit to balance the Roy Moores of the world in terms of the public presentation um, of Christianity. So I was really delighted to be asked to do this, not least because I'm an external processor, as my poor team know uh, to their detriment. And it's a great opportunity to um, process some of the cognitive dissonance that I feel every Christmas. I remember last year sitting in Midnight Mass with my husband, singing Snow Has Fallen, Snow on Snow, thinking about the meteorological likelihood of snow in the Middle East. Um, and I turned to him and I said, I really would like to separate out the component parts of Christmas and give them their due. Because what I think uh, part of the confusion is around Christmas is we are celebrating almost three separate festivals at the same time. The first one is the one that we see on billboards and adverts uh, around here, the John Lewis advert uh, that is very in your face. And it's essentially a festival of domesticity, of childhood and of prosperity. It grew up mainly in the Victorian era, as we know, and I think Paul will say a little bit more about that. And now it's just a really useful trope of capitalism. It tells us that giving and receiving the perfect gift uh, will, will bring us into loving relationships. It tells us that if we have the most delicious meal of the year, we'll raise to more sensual heights. It talks to us about just sinking into the most kind of wonderful, sensual, comfortable circumstances we can create for ourselves, rich with nostalgia. And that that is all just what everyone does at this time of year. It tends to deify the nuclear family in ways that can make us um, quite more lonely. It puts enormous pressure on people, especially women, to create magic and to create perfection. And as we've heard, it creates more waste than any other time of year. And of course, a lot of it is really lovely and I'm really looking forward to it, even though I know all of those things. So there's already some confusion there. Second festival is the remnants of older pagan festivals about the rhythm of the year and the natural world. The winter solstice and Yule and Saturnalia. Many of these pre-Christian uh, cultures had midwinter festivals with some um, noticeable overlap in their themes about feasting, about celebrating the greenery, about gift giving about light in the darkness. And as a Christian who, if I ever lost my faith in God, would be a pagan, I love a lot of that as well. I think it's, um, it's a wonderful element. Interestingly, one component part of those older celebrations of Christmas, which has been completely lost, is the anarchic status upending element of Christmas, which was really central for many, many centuries. Some historians trace it to pagan traditions, some to a much more radical um, expression of the early church, which challenged status. But really, up to the Victorian period, Christmas uh, in most places was a day of drunken carousing, where hierarchies got completely upended. I remember when I studied, studied medieval drama, there was often this trope of a fool getting to be king for the day. Servants might get the run of the manor on Christmas Day. And still in some um, parts of the army, you have a tradition in the mess where the officers will serve the lower ranks. But mostly, it's completely died out. So we have the domestic Christmas. We have the pagan Christmas. And of course, underneath, around, poking out between those, we have a Christian festival. But it's a festival that actually has a slightly strange relationship with the church. It didn't start being celebrated into quite late in the life of the church. There have been whole centuries in which it wasn't particularly a big deal in the church calendar. Easter was much more important. Other festivals like Epiphany and All Souls Day. And still there are the um, inheritors of Cromwell, more Puritan-leaning parts of the church throughout the world, who, who refuse to celebrate Christmas at all. And it's also based on some really quite odd bits of the Bible. I don't know if you've ever been back to read the Bible stories in the original text. It's in two places in the Gospels, um, two slightly different tellings, and we have a kind of syncretized version of them. There's shepherds in one and, and, king, and wise, wise men in the other. Um, you don't get them both in the same place. 
So the snowy Christmas cards that we get are almost unrecognisable from those quite odd, even quite dark texts in the Bible. There's a few obvious things, like there's no, not only are there no kings, there's no mention of numbers. It might have been 100, it might have been one. Um, there's no stable in there. There's lots of details that we get from culture that just aren't in there, and lots of other details that we never hear about. And I think the thing for me that's most... Um, important that's missing, and there's a Theos report about this called The Politics of Christmas, is the political background. It starts, or at least one of the starts, uh, one of the texts starts by referencing the center of power, Caesar Augustus, uh, Quirinius, you know, the, the high status men in togas. And then it zooms out and zooms in in a completely different place. The Jews in Palestine at the time the Jews in Palestine at the time were an occupied, oppressed minority. The air is thick with political unrest, with rumours of revolution. The cosy trip to Bethlehem on a little donkey is in fact part of a mass forced movement of people. There's something very sinister about what is going on. Bethlehem is a backwater town in a backwater province at the very outer edges of empire, as far, as, as far away as you can imagine from where important things happen. Nothing important happens there, especially to poor families, to women who have created scandal, to the underclasses, the marginalised, the poorest of the poor, the lowest of the low, the shepherds. The stories of these people in the ancient Near East are never recorded. Nothing happens in places like these. After Jesus is born, the text records that there is a, a, a massacre of baby boys, uh, that Herod is so jealous of this idea of a king coming from this incredibly low status position to threaten him, that he uh, massacres babies under two, and so Jesus' family flees. He becomes a refugee in the Middle East. He starts his life as an asylum seeker. It's none of it is cosy or comforting. Everything in there is disturbing and unsettling. It's not going to help us have the perfect Christmas or a magical time or steep ourselves in nostalgia and cinnamon. Neither is it a generalised celebration of the turning of the seasons that helps us mark the rhythm of the year in a way that feels like it's gone on for centuries, the same thing, the trees shed their leaves and they grow them again. No, this is a break point. It's got a scandalous particularity to it and a radically subversive statement about where power and significance really lie. So you've got three separate festivals, all of which are a bit weird within themselves. Domestic festival of prosperity and warmth and closing in on ourselves. The pagan festival, which is a bit spikier, but only really exists still in, in remnants. And then this really weird Christian bit. And the three come together sometimes with a screech of gears and sparking metal. And I think the centrality of children at Christmas is part of the problem. So I have this funny thing that when I talk to adults about my Christian faith, and I love doing this, and I've had lots of glasses of wine with Jonathan and Pippa and others in the room, and we've talked about the questions and the baggage and the intellectual elements and the emotional elements, and I love doing it. And every time I do it, my conviction that there is something good and true and beautiful here grows. My faith is strengthened. When I talk to children, the exact opposite thing happens. I have a three-year-old girl, and she started asking really good questions like, Mummy, where's God? Trying to explain the Christian story to children requires us to oversimplify um, to the point of absurdity. To make it less mind-bending and disturbing, we have this cosy, almost entirely animal-based version. My daughter this year is a nativity mouse. <laughs> I'm being serious, that's what she's doing. <laughs> we have the pretty bits around the edges with the angels and the really cleaned up, made socially acceptable shepherds but the idea at the centre that God was so determined to be in relationship with us, with humankind, that he loved everyone, each individual, so enduringly and powerfully that he would lay down that high status, that he would give up power and peace and distance and the love within the Trinity to come and really live our broken lives and ultimately to suffer alongside us. It's just not something you can fit inside the mind of a head, uh, in the mind of a child. 
It's not really something you can fit inside the mind of an adult. Christmas for Christians is about the incarnation, and, and carne here is the same root as chili con carne, it's meat. God with meat on. God made flesh. The word, the logos, if you know any Greek philosophy, the logos become a person. And that person isn't a king or an emperor, but a powerless, poor, stateless, scandal-ridden, marginalized refugee infant. It's really, really weird, like the Christian bit of the Christmas story. My husband is a philosopher of science and he trained in physics and he always talks about how um, the first thing you do in a physics degree, or the first thing he did, is you have to unlearn everything you've learned in GCSE physics and A-level physics because it's so simplified as to be wrong. And I feel like the version of Christmas that most of us have received, because we only really receive it through nativity plays, is the equivalent of GCSE physics versus what they do at CERN with the Large Hadron Collider. There's a connection, but not a massive one. So I don't really know what the solution is to all this. Um, I was thinking as I wrote this that I really might just stop celebrating the Christian bit in December. <laughs> uh, I might instead make a big deal of epiphany or something in January where I can sit with the strangeness and the radicalness of it. And then on December the 25th, I can really focus on the also very important family supermarket all butter mince pie taste test. And maybe in February, I'll bring some of the green leaves inside the house and I'll light some candles and I'll give thanks for the light that is coming. Thank you.